everyone, I am so happy you chose to join us again. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again we say thank you for bringing us together again. Thank you for your word. We pray as always that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. I am so happy that you chose to join us again uh, as we study our articles of faith. And we are on article number 13, a gospel church. <clears throat> Our author writes, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by the covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ, governed by his laws and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, that it that its only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, and deacons whose qualifications, claims, and duties are defined in the epistles to Timothy and Titus. So our scripture uh, continues to come from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. Uh, and in times past, we've read the verses 1 through 13 in its entirety, uh, but today we will only read verses 4 through 6, and again we're coming from the NIV version. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 4 through 6, NIV, says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in him you have been enriched in every way in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. So on the front end of our study, uh, again, we need to keep in mind the occasion for which Paul is writing this letter. The church that was in Corinth was acting badly, or as the old folks used to say, they were cutting up. They were acting just like the world around them, and yet Paul reminds them of what God says about them. They were saints set apart for God's good pleasure. And so without even stating the problem, Paul begins his letter by reminding them of what it means to be a saint. Paul thanked God for them. Now, he didn't thank God for how they were acting, nor was he thanking God because they were this huge uh, congregation. He, he, he didn't say that he just thanked God, say, one time for them. He says, I always thank God for you, meaning it was not just a one-time thing. You ever find yourself thanking God for folk uh, when they are doing well by you? You know, when they're being nice and, and everything's going good. But when folk are cutting up badly, the thought might creep into your mind, I wish I'd never met those folk. Paul says, in the midst of these folk acting up, he says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. And y'all, that tells me that I can always thank God. I can always have something to thank God for, especially for those who are called saints. Whether we're acting like it or not, if we are a true child of God, he has given us the gift of grace in Christ Jesus. And Paul says, for in him you have been enriched in every way in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. That word enriched means to make rich or richer, especially by the addition of or the increase in some desirable quality or attribute or ingredient. I'm one of those people that could probably drive you crazy if you ever went shopping with me, grocery shopping in particular with me. <clears throat> I will take the time to read the ingredients in pretty much all of the food that I'm buying. 
I, I even, I will even go so far as to pull out my phone and Google an ingredient to find out what it is and what it does to the body and do I really want it. And after doing all that, sometimes I put it back because I don't want it. it it's like in the case of, of, of white bread, white bread and even some wheat bread, it will list an ingredient as enriched flour or enriched uh, wheat flour. That means that during the processing of the flour, all or most of the vitamins and minerals were stripped out. So what they do is after stripping out what was naturally there, they add back man-made stuff and call it enriched. When we come to Christ, most often the world has beat us down, beat us up, beat us down, beat us all the way around. That, that's all of us or most of, of the, it, it means that, that most of the decency that may have been there at one time or another have been stripped. The hymn writer says, I came to Jesus just as I was, wearied, wounded, and sad. Now, that's stripped. That's beat down. That, that is drained. He goes on to say, I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. That's being enriched. That's receiving nourishment. In order for me to go from weary, wounded, and sad to resting and glad, something had to have added had to have been added to my life to make it richer. Paul says, we have been given the gift of grace through God, well, through God's son, Jesus Christ. He says, for in him, we have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. In Christ, Every part of a believer has been enriched in every way necessary. Namely, for the, for the problem concerning the church at Corinth, he's saying, he points out that they have been enriched in all of their speaking and in all of their knowledge. That's important because these folk were not speaking according to the knowledge that they had been given. Can you agree with me that sometimes we speak like we don't have any knowledge of the Lord? Now, you know, I'm not talking about the folk that always are careful to say all of the churchy stuff, but I'm talking about, I'm talking to folk like me that sometimes find yourselves in conversations that are not always becoming or looking at or listening to stuff that will cause the unbelieving world to question if you really know the Lord. Stuff that if Christ came back at that moment, it would be hard to tell you from the unbeliever. The other day, here's an example. The other day, I was strolling through the stuff on, on YouTube looking for a particular thing. And, you know, as anybody know that has strolled on any type of social media, uh, you know that a thousand and one things will come up to distract you from what you're really looking for. Well, one such thing that caught my attention was that an actor from back in the day that I always admired or liked to see was uh, I hadn't seen her in a while, you know, but she was on an, uh, an excerpt of a talk show and, and she was in a new series and, and, you know, and I wrote the series down so that I could remember to check it out. Anyway, so I remembered to check it out and I, I'm purposely not telling you who it, who it was or, or what it was she was on because I know somebody will be tempted as I was, but y'all. The show, it, it, it was it was one of those uh, several episode show, and I was just watching the first one, just part of the first one, and it was so disgusting. I never got to the part where the actor that I was actually looking for was in. 
you know, because she was somebody's mother. But I switched that channel like a kid being caught doing what they knew they shouldn't do. Paul says that you have been enriched in all of your speaking and in all of your knowledge. It is that enrichment that caused me to say, if that's what she's in, I won't be seeing it. Peter, in 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 through 4, says the same thing in a different way. He says, and this is the NIV, at 2 Peter, the first chapter, verses 3 and 4, he says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We live in a world that is always looking for life and, and, and not just life, but we're always looking for more of it. But the reality is, that the minute we are born, the death clock starts ticking, counting down to death. We, we are always in the process of dying, always moving toward the goal. I'm sorry, toward the grave. It, it doesn't matter how many, uh, how, how many uh, live a long time or how long you live or how many live long strategies we might incorporate in our daily lives, we still die daily. Now, I'm all about being health conscious, but know that it will not give life. Hopefully, it will add to the quality of life, of the life you have, and, and that's a good thing, but it won't give you life. Man cannot manufacture life at best. We exist for what seems to be a few years. And as Job says, they are filled with trouble. So where does life come from? Who has the power to stop the process of death and to deliver us from death? Peter says that there is divine power, the very power of Christ himself. The opposite of life is death. You cannot have life and death at the same time. In Christ, we are given life. Without Christ, we are dying. You ever notice in the Bible that nobody dies in the presence of Jesus? When life is present, death has to flee. That's why Jesus had to lay down his life in order to die on the cross. And, 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 and that is the only way death would happen for him. That is why he said, if I lay it down, I can pick it up again. Peter says that that same divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And the amazing thing is that he allows us to participate in the receiving process. We receive life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You ever ask the question, how can I live a Christian life? Or better yet, do you sometimes as, as, as a Christian make the statement, I just don't have it in me to live as I should. Listen again to what Peter says. He says, his divine power has given, not will give, but has given, so he, he says, his divine power has given us everything, not some things. He, he didn't give us some things and leave out other things. His divine power has given us everything we need. He hasn't given to some and not to others. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Now, here's the showstopper. For most folk, we've got to do something. It, 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 it's a given 
but we have to participate. I mean, it's given, but we have to participate. Let me say that again. The showstopper for most folk is that we got to do something. It's given to us, but we have to participate. It's given through our knowledge of, of him, of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said in Matthew 11, verse 11, chapter, verse 28 and 29, he says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and here it is, learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Peter wrote that God has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We can have the assurance that there is nothing that we need that God has not provided or will not provide for us. God is all in. Christ is all in. The Holy Spirit is all in. The question is, are we all in? Well, that's all I have for today. Join us again next week as we continue with article number 13, A Gospel Church. Until then, be blessed and stay safe. Bye-bye.